too late. So I applaud if you've spoken. And of course, in particular, Jill Wood. It's a very big thing. Staff 
who can both proactively inform middle residents <coughs> and answer any questions about how to tackle the climate emergency as individuals. If given clear and well-reasoned guidance and incentives, people will take on the challenge of adapting their own lifestyles to respond to the climate emergency. The authority should create and make available to residents an exhaustive register or database of all the steps individuals can take to combat climate degradation. Yes. From refusing supermarket products with excessive packaging yes. to yes. avoiding unnecessary car travel. Yes. The carbon footprint of each action should be quantified yes. and ways of reducing this footprint should be indicated allowing people to monitor their own contribution. Since being elected as council here in Wirral, as Green Council here in Wirral, since that like this, I received emails from colleagues up and down the country who have helped to persuade their own councils to declare a climate emergency backed by robust action plans. St Albans District Council, for example, declared a climate emergency only last week with the goal to cut carbon emissions to zero by 2030. Wirral must not be seen to be dragging its feet any further in this vital policy area. I would urge you to support the Second Amendment. Thank you. The bill's on the green belt. Could we have a seconder of the motion, Councillor uh, Tony Norbury? Now I've got three minutes on to speak to Thank you, Mr Mayor. I'd like to congratulate Jim Wall, Andy Corkle and Chris Cook, uh, Cook on their making speeches. I would like to second the Climate Emergency Environmental Emergency Motion. And I've got some inspiration from uh, Brian, who presented at Cool Will, and he wanted everybody, when we had the Cool Will event, to come out with their hands a little bit sweaty and their hearts beating a bit, because this is an emergency, and our adrenaline, our adrenaline needs to go up a little bit. In, in the case of an emergency, as, as we do in all emergencies. I would like to present you in that case with two alternative visions of our future. The first is a picture of a clean and safe world. We have harnessed renewable energy and technology. This has helped us clean up the oceans free of all plastic. The air is clear and people enjoy abundant plant and animal life across our planet. <coughs> Trees have been planted years earlier and now provide valuable shade, oxygen and food while also preventing flooding. The trees will absorb what few carbon emissions humans now create. Yes. It is a happy picture of plenty and sustainability. It is a planet Earth as it could and should be. Unfortunately, I now present a second scenario. Much more alarming picture, scorched air, famine and mass extinctions and suffering. Most of our now overheated planet is floodplains and deserts and the few humans left are fighting wars over clear water and fertile land. In areas once deemed uninhabitable, Areas that were once covered with the ice and snow, which has long melted into our barren oceans. It is not an exaggeration. This vision, vision is based on UN predictions and scientific fact. We have a choice to make. Survive and flourish or ignore the scientists and continue on our path towards annihilation. We have just one decade until climate destruction becomes irreversible. Yeah. I urge you to support this declaration. Let's stop being part of the problem and become part of the solution. And lead the way on Wirral by sustaining our existing trees yes. and avoid yeah. at all costs building on our precious green belt. Sustaining our environment, reducing harmful gases, gases that are literally choking us and our planet. We should avoid at all costs turning grass into cash and have progressive planning policy that prioritise our environment and climate 
uncertainty over corporate developers' profits. Yes. 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 A very relevant quote that was said by Alanis in 1932 as a North American native. Just bear with me. Just, just come to a close. When the last tree is cut and the last fish is caught, the last river polluted, when to breathe the air is sickening, you will all realise too late that wealth is not in our bank accounts and that you cannot eat money. I second this proposal. tree strategy in development, which will see thousands of new trees planted. Stop running the ones we've we got! We are already bidding into the fund mentioned, and despite Tory austerity, we intend to go ahead with all of our plans. We also have a pollinators plan ready to present to scrutiny. We are indeed already planning for a modal shift from car to active travel. We have already provided charging facilities for electric vehicles and are investigating more. And I do agree that active travel and public transport are the real solution. Most importantly, we will ensure that all policies across the Council will be fully assessed for their impact on climate change. What we really need is a change of government so that all these efforts will be supported by a government in Westminster that actually do care about climate change. We need the Citizens' oh, Assembly. Citizens' Assembly, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, you Councillor. Right, since both amendments have been accepted, um, I, I, we can now move to the, uh, the original motion moved <coughs> by Councillor Elizabeth Gray. And um, now we are going to. Um,
Right, may I have a proposer and seconder, please? So moved, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Watt. Um, and can I have a formal seconder, please? Seconder, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Tom. Um, Notice of the giving of response to requisition in respect of this item. This is also set out on page 3 of the agenda supplement. May I have a proposer and seconder for the pre notified response amendment, please? So moved, Mr. Brown. second, Mr. Thank you. Okay, uh, moving the motion and amendments. Councillor Geoffrey Watt, you now have up to five minutes to speak to the motion. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. May I begin by congratulating Councillors Wood, Corkill and Cook on their maiden speeches. Uh, I found that many people have either forgotten or do not realise just how long the sorry saga has taken to me to this point. I believe it was, it was at the December meeting council in 2002, 16 and a half years ago, that then leader of the council announced that the Open Golf Championship would be returning to the world in 2006 after a gap of 29 years. By the following year, 2003, a vision list of possible regeneration opportunities in West Wirral would be drawn up, including a golf resort, a luxury hotel, a new public realm in Wollick and West Kirby, a new promenade for Wollick and Mells, a greater concourse yeah. development with a new health centre relocated to fire station in West Kirby, and a new visitor centre for Royal Country Park in Thurston. Consultants were appointed, preliminary reports received, and our former colleague, Councillor Jerry Ellis, is succeeded to be chairman of the West World Area Forum, embarked upon a total of 32 afternoon and evening public consultation meetings held in Wollick and West Kirby. As I recall this, at that time, the only disadvantage associated with the golf resort might have been the so-called enabling development required to finance the scheme, which was said to be 40, yes, 4 oh, just 40 millionaires' houses. Think Wentworth and Sunningdale. The only impediment said not to be insurmountable might be the Greenbelt designation of the site, albeit overlaid as requiring landscape improvement. Well, the 2006 open came and went, public road improvements in Wallex Market Street were completed, and consultation began on a new local plan for Wirral. Public meeting was organised by an individual which revealed the ecological importance of the existing varied habitats and hydrology within the Gulf Resort site. Mm -hmm. European funding for Merseyside ended and plans for public realm in the central West Kirby were consulted from and shelved. The banks precipitated an economic recession and the opportunity for a new health centre in West Kirby not dependent on the Greater Concourse scheme was lost. And oh yes, the enabling development for the Gulf Resort had changed from 40 millionaires' houses to more than 100 executive homes and rising. The concept of the Hoylake Housing Estate was born. Yeah. Then, in 2014, the Open returned to Hoylake, but it was not until July 2015 that the Nicholas Joint Venture Group was announced as the Council's preferred development partner. This was followed by a long promised but unsatisfactory public exhibition with vague plans and consultation with, typically in such cases, three questions capable of misinterpretation to suit those commissioning them. In November 2016, the Cabinet decided to enter into a framework development agreement with the Nick Routh Joint Venture Group and to authorise almost £600,000 further expenditure on fees as the previous, previous budget of £237,000 had been spent. This decision was called in by members of the Conservative Group to a special meeting of the Business Overview and Scrutiny Committee, then chaired by Councillor Sullivan. The first reason given for the call-in was the signatories to this call-in are deeply concerned that by agreeing to the Confidential Framework Development Agreement, the Council is effectively committed to a done deal with no clear exit strategy should the proposal prove not to be viable or financially and environmentally sustainable. <coughs> Defending the policy, the then leader of the Council said he did not believe that it was a done deal as the Council still retained control over the project with a funding strategy due to come to Cabinet in March 2017. My motion to refer the decision back to Cabinet was defeated and the agreement was signed the following day. Members may like to note that the funding strategy was only received by officers for analysis in February this year, almost two years late, and has not yet come back to Cabinet. All this time, local opposition was building and at a packed public meeting in December 2017, organised by Margaret Greenwood MP, the then leader of the council faced the full strength of that opposition and yet maintained his support for his golf resort. 
despite having been quoted in the World Globe saying, I am not prepared to allow our green belt land to be built on. Let's go about that commitment. It is the jewel in Riddle's crown, which we value by our yeah. residents. In 2018, a consultation was held allowing rural residents to come up, comment on proposals to which parcels of green belt land might be released for development of the new urban plan. Members may recall that no part of the Gulf Resort site was included in that consultation. At the Extraordinary Council in February this year, requisitioned by the Conservative Group, Council played these motion called upon Council to recommend that the Cabinet listen to the people of the world and withdraw from this scheme yes. in its entirety, given the uncertainty, the massive public opposition, a financial risk to the taxpayer, and the harm that we caused to those green belts. That motion was defeated by just one vote, with at least one Labour member who voted against it, stating that although he was not in favour of the Gulf Resource, he would not vote to stop it there, as he yeah. hoped to remain part of that group, but after the May elections would choose a new leader who would appoint the Cabinet that would make the decision. Well, Mr. Mayor, the electorate duly voted in May, the now minority Labour group had chosen their new leader. With the support of the other two parties, he was appointed leader of the council and has chosen his cabinet. So come on, cabinet, let's have some clarity. Just tell the people of Wirral you really support our green belts and are going to drop the golf resort now. Yeah. <laughs> Studied it from last January onwards, 
and according to emails I exchanged with senior officers in recent days, the funding strategy appears to be acceptable for officers. We're in a situation where planning will be the major hurdle, and as I indicated that in early this year, the Secretary of State, in my view, will inevitably call this project in, and we're then into the period of even further delays. I will turn to the Cabinet report of the time, because the Cabinet report in December 2017 said the planning decision would take place in June 2019. So, we're a long way on from that, and it's a long way behind schedule. And of course, the new issues have emerged. When our officer was asked at the Royal West Constituency Committee in March, he explained that the Council has entered into a development agreement with Celtic Manor, and if the Council were to break that agreement, then they could be open to legal action. So, so that matter has also been referred to in Wirral Matters, the Wirral Society magazine where they say, we hope this will at least delay the council leader submitting a funding and phasing plan to cabinet. As we understand it, such an agreement could commit the council to incurring financial penalties if it decided later to pull out of the deal. Well, bring it on, you've already spent millions tax. on it. So that's where we are in reality. And we are there because too many members, unfortunately, were not able to read and study the documentation throughout this period led the council to take an over-optimistic decision. This the result is to yeah. now need the council, all members of the council outside yeah. the yeah. council, yeah. to know everything that's going on, to know what the risks are, and to explore ways of ending the project with honour on both sides and honour to the people of Hoyland. Honour. <laughs> okay, um, we're now going to... Uh, so, yeah, okay, Councillor Patrick. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, congratulate Councillors uh, Cork, Hill, Cook, and one on their maiden speech. Very good speeches. First of all, I'd like to thank members of the Business Scrutiny Committee who looked at this and debated it in great detail and passed on their recommendations. Uh, it was proposed by Councillor Byrne and seconded by Councillor Fouts at that meeting and yeah. passed on their yeah. uh, recommendations to us, the new cabinet. Um, as a decision making body. Cabinet members had long and varied discussions with Mr Mayor after reading the reports in detail. The view was that this was a huge investment for the council and we did not feel this was the right time for us to be able to make a commitment of this scale. We have many other priorities as a new leadership team, protecting the vulnerable, building on brownfield sites, pursuing a policy of brownfield first, protecting our green beds and ensuring a better range of social housing are all higher up our agenda, I believe, than investments such as this one before us in this scheme. <laughs> we are going to use scarce public resources to kickstart social house building in Wirral. We're going to use it to rebuild new ferry, kickstart Wirral waters and those huge brownfield sites the biggest in the North West, and transform Birkenhead beyond recognition. community wealth, led by Councillor Jeanette Williamson, in those areas which need a helping hand. Our priorities are clear. We are a new listening council. And the decision, well, we've proved it with the decision we made to date. And the decision we made on the Hoyleg scheme is proof, as I've said, of our commitment to that. Scrap it. Yeah. Scrap it Scrap it all together. Scrap it now, never mind the consequences. Mr Just Mayor, Will is open for business. We've secured £140 million in new investment into the board <coughs> over the past four years. And through our partnership with Muse in Will Grow Company, we're moving forward with major developments at Birkenhead, Bromra and Morton with the support of members opposite, just to get started. Wirral Waters is also moving with schemes coming forward at pace. This is a council determined to bring investment, jobs and prosperity to Wirral. That's why major players like Celtic Manor and Red Row want to build here in the first place. Sorry, look, please be quiet in the, the
public gallery. It's hard not to. Please listen. As I say, Mr Mayor, mindful of our commitment to the Green Agenda and Green Charter that we're putting forward, that was put forward so eloquently by Councillor Liz Gray earlier on. So it is a massive investment um, and we decided we would not bother to invest in this scheme and money would be better spent, as I said, on securing affordable and social housing for the many residents who need it elsewhere in our borough. Those in need and struggling that us as a new administration are determined to help. Thank you, Mr. We will be watching you. Eco homeless. That's what you need. Eco homeless, not red rose. Sorry, can you just sit down a moment? Look, if this continues, I might have to remove some people from the gallery. It's not fair of being the councillors here to be shouted at. So please be quiet. Listen. Yes, we pay your taxes, mate. Okay. Councillor Michael Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to congratulate Councillors Ward, Corkill, and Paul Congal for making speeches. I hope I do just as good. The former leader of this council, Phil Davis, said Green Belt is the jewel of the Lord's crown. No truer word has been spoken. Sadly, Mr. Mayor, the actions of this council don't back up these words. They are but they embark on an onslaught of wanting to build on the Green Belt for the Celtic Manor Resort. While I welcome the Labour Cabinet's U-turn not to give £26 million to the developer, this decision is two years too late. Yeah. Mr Mayor, thousands of people signed a petition against this golf resort. They did nothing. Their highly paid consultants told them the project was financially unviable, and still they did nothing. Hundreds, hundreds of ordinary people came to protest outside this very town hall. And still, Mr Mayor, guess what? Yeah. They did nothing. It's only now, bereft of their majority, that they see fit to listen to the message they hear from thousands of people from across the world. Yet, they allow the threat of this development to hang over our heads. Let us and the public never forget, Mr Mayor, that the Labour cabinets haven't withdrawn from the Hoylake project in town. How long is it going to take them to simply say there will be no Hoylake Golf Resort? Yeah. When will they take the ground off the table, the heads out of the sand, and end yeah. this wasteful folly once and for all? Does their willful disregard for the people of Wirral's wishes no, no bounds. Mr Mayor, I stood for election in May because I wanted to represent the area I live and love. Every door I knocked on, my friends, my neighbours, even the opposition, told me they didn't support building on the Green Belt, whether Hoyley, Pendleton or anywhere in the world. Thank you. 
Mr. Mayor, um, I, I will be brief because I'm conscious that we have probably gone on slightly longer. Um, I'm also uh, conscious that um, the head of law will probably want me to quote verbatim something that I'm about to say because I know obviously following his quite horrific toboggan accident, he, uh, he will require me to follow exactly the words. At a special meeting of the Business Overview and Scrutiny Committee in December 2016, Reviewing the decision to sign the Framework Development Agreement for Labour's Golf Resort, his predecessor, Mr Hackett's predecessor, you may remember him. <laughs> okay, you may not remember him. His predecessor is reported in the minutes as saying, the signing of the agreement did not mean the council would be locked in. And we would retain absolute discretion to withdraw from the whole scheme should the funding strategy not prove to be acceptable. Now, having listened to some excellent speeches uh, from some of my colleagues, um, Cook, Corker, Collins, and Wood, I have to say that something in the state of Denmark smells slightly. Because we actually have a situation whereby the council cannot withdraw. Okay. We are committed. The cheap scam double glazing man has been to our house. We signed on the dotted line and we are no longer able to cancel the contract. And I would like to know what the council leader intends to do to formally investigate either corruption or incompetence. Oh, yeah. Yeah.
investigations, uh, well, I have to say, phased in such a way that those who wish to could consider that defamation. Uh, members in this chamber are not protected from any personal action taken by individuals who feel they have been defamed. Um, that's my advice to you. Uh, beyond that, um, I do accept the question was quite carefully phrased. Um, however, some of the hyperbole that went with it may not be quite so carefully phrased. Um, and members should take that upon their own advice as to the uh, tone and content of some of the speeches. Okay, thank you very much for that advice. Right, plans for you to this. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I can't uh, comment on my colleague's uh, reference to corruption, but I can tell you if there was to be an investigation into incompetence of the previous cabinet, we'd be here all year. <laughs> <laughs> The other three uh, new members who've spoken since I last spoke, Councillor Corker, Councillor Cook and Councillor Collins. Uh, I'd also like to thank Councillor Watt and to say how good it is to see him being released from the Office of Mayor and having him back on these benches and making his point so eloquently on behalf of the people that he represents. Uh, Mr Mayor, I'd also like to thank uh, Councillor Williamson, unusually, he's probably not expecting this, but at the Cabinet meeting when the Cabinet, the new Cabinet, as the Council leaders referred to it, I'll come on to that in a moment, but the, the Cabinet member for Finance uh, said that now is not the right time to invest £26 million of public money in a golf resort uh, and that circumstances have changed. Uh, she's yes. right, of course, as the previous Cabinet member for Finance who supported this deal, I welcome the fact that she's changed her mind. No, there's nothing wrong with changing your mind. I congratulate Councillor Williamson on taking that decision. Uh, but let's not pretend it's on any basis but principle in terms of the Labour cabinet. The reason why they have withdrawn the financial deal is because they lost seats in the election. That is the only reason this deal has been withdrawn. If they still had a majority in the council chamber, the financial package would still be in place. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mr Mayor, I'd also like to thank at this point um, one person in particular who's not a councillor and his politics are probably as far to the left uh, as mine should probably get, and that is to Phil Simpson. Phil Simpson has done more than any individual in this borough to put the, uh, the council where it is today, where we have withdrawn from the financial agreement and where there are calls not to build on the green belt at all. And on behalf of the Conservative Group, I would like to thank Phil Simpson and everybody. <laughs> to uh, comments by Councillor Gilchrist. Um, he referred to some of the decision making and how we've reached these decisions. And I have to say it has been uh, like pulling teeth trying to find information about these deals, yes. the agreements, what's been signed, what hasn't been signed, what's been agreed, who agreed it and when. Mr Mayor, there has been there has been no openness or transparency of this whole process. And that's and that corruption. Is why, and that is why we're now at this point in this council debate some yes. several years after it was first proposed. Mr Mayor, uh, Councillor Gilchrist also referred to the, the possibility that this decision could be referred to planning. Well, Mr Mayor, I don't want it to be referred to planning because I want a decision to be taken before it gets